Hello and welcome to episode 173 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings, and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary singer, songwriter and musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And on this episode of the Paul Weller Fan Podcast, we meet Simon O'Brien and hear his journey from Style Council fan in his teens to joining Paul Weller's tour security in 2000. We talk Red Wedge, the Paul Weller movement, and being in the right place at the right time for the heliocentric tour with a band on fire. You'll hear stories on Paul, John Weller, Kenny Wheeler, and unforgettable gigs across the UK, including V2000, Glasgow's Gig on the Green, and the final night of that tour at Earl's Court. Lots of stories to unpack. Let's get into it. Simon O'Brien, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for letting me come on. I'm looking forward to digging into your experiences as a huge Style Council fan, a Paul Weller fan, and how this leads into you joining the Inner Circle in 2000. Yeah, yeah, it'd be a privilege, but just remember what goes on tour stays on tour so <laughs> this may be a very short conversation oh no, 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 good <laughs> uh, let's kick off with the style council so your discovery of paul weller wasn't a jam it was the style council well obviously i was aware of the jam the mod scene was sort of coming in back into fashion around 78 79 when i was in school i was a massive blondie fan though. i really like blondie i love my music i like the sex pistols quite into the sex pistols really because my nickname is sid for some strange reason they had a big thing around sid vicious uh, more so probably because he had no talent really but he was still a massive star so and that that nickname name has still stood with me all these years so but obviously I was aware of the jam and it was a sort of style council really for me it was like about the clothes and and the music it sort of fitting more to me than and what the jam did really maybe down to my age and but what sort of really hit it off for me is like when I hear my ever changing moods because you know at 17 I've got a mood disorder you know I have had it all my life but I've managed it and and I thought someone else who understand do you know what i mean because at that age you think am i the only one who's like this so when i heard my ever-changing moods i thought wow someone else knows i was very political me and um when i was 15 i was sent for an interview for a job at um a painting place in longside where i grew up in manchester and i got there and there was like 10 or 15 people all in overalls eating chips and it was like something from charles dickens and he said to me have you come for the job and i said no i've got the wrong place because even at that age I didn't go to school for 11 years to end up on a, you know, and I don't want to sound arrogant here, but it's just the way I was. I thought, you know, I've been to school. I wasn't that intelligent at school. I was a good footballer. Like probably what most people like at that age. I love clothes. I love Man City. I love music. And I just walked out, thought, no, way I'm having that. I eventually got a proper job, as I put it, as an apprentice wood machinist at a cooperative where they were all quite political, really, the people I work with. When they interviewed me, they said to me, what do you think of trade unions? So I said, I love them. I said, and if I get the job here, the first thing I'll do is join in a trade union, which could have been detrimental towards me, really, because, you know, they might have thought it was a troublemaker, but I say how I feel, and it was just fortunate that... The guy who interviewed me was the vice president of the timber union. So basically, <laughs> right. I nailed the job there and then. So I suppose what reiterated it really, you know, that job I worked in, I was quite active around the miners' strike, 84, when it? So I was sort of second year apprentice. And, you know, I went on a lot of marches supporting the miners. I had £5 a week donated out of my wages towards the miners' families, you know, for food. And so I was qu- quite politically, really. And then, I remember seeing the band on the Lenny Henry show and I remember them doing You're the Best Thing and they all had Call Not Stole stickers on, which I had on at the time, you know what I mean? And I thought, wow, they're not flying around in helicopters and big limousines. You stand for the people. That sort of just really nailed it for me then around the political stuff and all that. I thought, you know what, you're real. You lads are real, you know, and they obviously, you know, and I'm not saying all oh, pop stars and people in music are like that. There's a lot of beautiful people, you know, and there's a lot of not so beautiful. But for me, that sort of nailed it because of what I was doing at the time, young 16, 17 year old supporting 
the miners because I was into politics and to see a band wearing stickers and, and, and supporting the working class, that just nailed it for me, really. And that wasn't the norm in the hit parade, top 10 artists. Everybody wasn't doing this, right? Because obviously you had Red Wedge a bit further on around the time, you know, where Johnny Marr, Big Man City fan, I love Johnny Marr, you know, he was involved in 86. Johnny Marr, I remember... The Kemp brothers been there and they did through the barricades and they actually said it's like City and United coming together. There were a few artists around that time who were sort of supporting the working class. To be fair, it wasn't just around the politics. It, it, it was around the clothes and obviously the songs and the lyrics. Particularly when Our Favourite Shop come out, I could relate to every song on there. I learnt more from Paul's music than I did at school about growing up in life, whether it be lost relationships, falling in love, moods, um, the way people are treated. That educated me as a kid, really, to be fair. You know, and stood me in good stead, you know, through the rest of my life. Well, we'll talk about some of the songs and the albums and the live gigs of the Style Council. I want to take you back to school, though, first of all, because you, you mentioned Manchester. You were in the same class as Noel Gallagher, right? Yep, that's correct. Um, I knew Noel since the age of 11. We were in the same class. I grew up in Noel. We didn't use to knock about together, but we were in the same class. And, and Paul Gallagher as well. We were still keeping contact with regular. Uh, obviously, Liam come when I left. And, and what a lot of people don't know, you know, it's always mentioned Burnage in Manchester, but originally the Gallaghers were brought up in Longside, which I'm very passionate about, Longside M13, on the next street to where I I lived. So, yeah, uh, I knew Noel from an early age and, and Paul, and, and particularly I want to mention Paul as well. There was only two people in my school, sort of 78, 79, who were mods. And one was my cousin, Sean, and the other one was Paul Gallagher. And they were the only people to have fishtail coats. I always wonder how Paul feels because the talk is all Noel and Liam and Oasis. Is he like, it's just utterly pissed off with hearing about his brothers the inside time? Or is he cool with it? <laughs> He's a good guy, Paul. Massive Man City fan. And, you know, we do keep in contact over sort of Instagram, you know. Uh, the top lad, Paul. Really good lad. You know, they're all good lads. Uh, you know, I've met Liam a few times and, you know, they've, they've all got their own stuff. And, and they're like Irish Catholic stock like me and a more important Man City fan, so yeah. Have there been any connections with you and Noel and Paul Weller? Well, funny enough, yeah. I remember an early Style Council gig at the Apollo in Manchester coming out at the end and just seeing Noel, because I'd not seen Noel probably since I left school, and this is before the band made it. And um, I remember one night they'd done a, a gig in Liverpool, I think, probably in 94, when they were first starting, and um I was in this uh, club in Manchester, quite a famous club, and they played a gig in Liverpool and Noel was at the bar and I remember saying to him, is there any chance of doing security, you know? And he went, we're not that big, Sid, we don't really need it. And the next time I seen him, I think, was at Earl's Court uh, in front of 15,000 people. <laughs> Getting back to your question, Dan, um, in 2000 we were doing um, B2000 down at Chelmsford and, and Noel and Liam were there and, you know, I'm on stage with a colleague of mine from London, Big Brendan, and, and I'm stood like at the side of the stage and Noel's next to me. Obviously, Noel was a good friend of Paul and still is. And it's surreal to think, you know, the both of us were in the same class and big fans of whatever. And here we are sort of all these years on, still in front of 60, 70,000 fans, whatever it is. I'm doing the band security. He's a megastar. It's just easy. <laughs> It's strange. Yeah, and also because he was, he, his initial entry into music, Noel, was as a roadie, wasn't it? It wasn't like songwriter, yeah. first of all. Noel was out with the carpets, in Spiral Carpets, so he started at a young age, touring, you know, as a roadie worldwide and all that. You know, getting back to that also, I also grew up with uh, Paul Arthurs as well, Bonehead. I knew Bonehead from a, from a young age and his sister, Celine, so... You know, there's quite a bit of a connection there with Oasis, to be fair, and, and Tony McCarroll. So. Now, let's talk about Style Council. So when did you first see them? What was your, would have been your first Style Council gig? Can you remember? Yeah, it was Red Wedge at the Apollo. You know, even though they'd been going from sort of 83, my sort of first chance to seeing them live was um, was at the Red Wedge concert at Manchester Apollo. And I wish I'd have kept my T-shirt now. It would have been worth a few quid. And they were incredible lineups, those, so weren't they? Yeah, it was good. You know, I still have a pretty good memory long term. And I m remember the camp saying, like, you know, they did through the barricades and they said, like, it's about bringing people together. It's like City and United. And, you know, and that resonated with me. And I thought, yeah, I get that. You know, I really get that. And, uh, you know... So, yeah, that was the first time I'd seen them live, really, and that sort of, wow. Yeah. yeah. 
think it was 87, I was stood outside the Apollo and waiting for the band to turn up. And Paul's got off and that's when I had my first photograph. And I said, can I have a photograph, please, Paul? He went, yeah, if you make it quick. You know <laughs> Every time, and I actually went to see him in Birmingham at the NEC. I think that was 87 when they played Jerusalem, you know, the video. And I love Jerusalem, man. But I got all that stuff, me. Some people may not understand it, but I got it all. I got the music, I got the clothes, I got the wind ups, you know. And um, so, yeah. The Style Council comes to an end, tail end of 89. There's a little bit of a gap, but then pulls back the Paul Weller movement. Was Paul Weller's solo your deal, your bag from day one? It was so good. He come back and I, I actually was one of them people that went to the uh, Paul Weller movement gig at Manchester Academy. I went to see him. Max Beasley was playing and Max Beasley's from Manchester as well, obviously. And um, I remember him mentioning the band members and he went, Manchester's own very Max Beasley. And I thought, who was he? You know what I mean? <laughs> He's done all right for himself, to be fair now, right? <laughs> it was strange, that gig as well, because some friends of mine, they actually did the security at the academy. I managed to um, like myself in the dressing room. I remember I've, I had the T-shirt from the gig with the big sort of uh, target on the front, and I remember Paul putting it. My lad was probably about three at that time, and he put to Simon and Kieran Perfect, and I remember Steve White signing it as well, and, you know, top lad Steve White. When is it that you start working in security as a job? Well, I worked for the local council and the first gig I ever did was 91. My cousin was like what they call local crew, a road there. And um, I ended up going with him to the NEC and I did Gloria Estefan into the light tour, just sort of putting all the stuff away at the end. And I thought, wow, this is me. I wanted to work in music, but the atmosphere in there and everything, the lights, the music, I love the music and all that. So that was my actual first sort of dip into working in music. So if it wasn't my cousin Liam, you know, taking me down there, then uh, I don't know what would have happened. But, you know, that sort of lit the flame for me, really, being in that environment, live music. And, and, and it was brilliant. I still listen on YouTube now and watch the Into the Lights also. From a Weller point of view, we then get that first solo album. We get Wildwood, we get Stanley Rowe, we get Heavy Soul. You're loving these albums, right? I love them all. There's certain songs that resonate with me. Every song had a meaning to me. Everyone has their own connection with certain songs, you know. All the songs are like, you know, you do something to me. Um, I lost a partner in 2014 to ovarian cancer and the last couple of holidays we had was in St. Anne's in Liverman. There's a windmill there. Heavens Above is filmed on the windmills and every time I go back to Liverman, you know, I'll spend a bit of time there and I, I have like this spiritual connection with, with windmills, believe it or not, because, you know, that sort of song resonates you know with my partner god bless her soul mm, the power of music right and let's talk about 2000s so how do you get to become i mean this is incredible how do you get to become part of the inner circle part of the crew basically what happened um obviously i've I'd, I'd been working at manchester arena um crowd management as well as my job and the band were doing a warm-up gig at the old 5-1 club in liverpool on the Saturday night, and my friend, he's a good friend of mine still now, he's the head of the company I was working for. He knew I was a big Paul Weller fan. Brendan, who was with the band at the time, doing full-time security, the band had requested, or John or Kenny had requested a couple of people to come to Liverpool, one to look after the bus, because apparently in the past, and this has not come from me, the bus has been broken into, and they wanted one for the dressing room. So obviously my friend said to me, do you want this? So I said, I'd love it, so... I got a friend of mine that I worked with who was a European Thai boxing champion. I said, do you want to come and do this gig? So we went out to Liverpool on the Saturday morning. We got fed. The crew were setting up. Anyway, the band turned up at whatever time, five o'clock, six o'clock for sound check. And um, Brandon's there. So he pulls me and he says, they've got young Nathaniel with him, which is obviously Paul's first son. And they want someone to look after him. So will you do it? So I said, yeah. So we'll go and introduce yourself to Paul. So I've gone over to Paul and Paul was brilliant. I've just said, hi, Paul. I, said, I think I said, hi, Mr. Weller. <laughs> I said, I'm going to be looking after your son, Nathaniel. So he said, great. He said, I'll introduce you to me, dad. So we go over to John, God bless his soul. So um, Paul's introduced me to him. So John's gone said to me, you make sure you look after my f***ing grandson. Right. So I said, I've got a son the same age, which Kieran was at the time. I said, your grandson will be fine, don't worry. I'm trying to think what age you'd have been, what, 12, 13? Kieran's 34 this year, I think. 11, 12, right, yeah. He was the same age as Nathaniel anyway, so, but, yeah. you know, 
I'm a granddad now. I have a granddaughter and, you know, I get totally what John was saying. Do you know what I mean? Because I'd, I'd be the same, but it was just funny the way he said it. God bless his soul. He went, you make sure you look after Bleak, my grandson. That's where it sort of started. And then um, I'm not sure where it started at all, but I was working in Stoke on the Tuesday evening with the company I work for. And I was supposed to be running the front of stage barrier. So John seen me and he said, we work for us again tonight. So I've gone and spoke to my sort of boss that evening. As I said, you know, he wants me. went, yeah, no worries. And I must have had an inkling that something was going to happen because I brought my tall laminate with me that I got on the Saturday. Maybe it was in hope. Maybe it was just, I don't know. What I did, I just put my black jacket over my company T-shirt and I threw the laminate around my neck. And So I'm having a conversation with John and he says to me, what have you done in the past? So I said, I looked after Chris Eubank one night, which I did. I said, but tomorrow I'll be back in Manchester driving a bin wagon in my side in the morning thinking, did that really happen? So then he says to me, would you fancy doing some more work for us? You know, I'll just check my diary, John, save and free. You know, of course I did. I jumped at it, do you know what I mean? Um, wow. And this is 2000, so this is Heliocentric albums just been out? Yeah, it was the Heliocentric. We were touring Heliocentric. It gets a bit of a bad rap, you know, and I think it's a terrific album. Paul seems to be a little dismissive of it. Primarily it's him, Craddock, Damon Minchella, Steve White. you got these beautiful string arrangements from Robert Kirby. It's a brilliant Brendan Lynch production. And you look at the track list. I did, I did this just before the chat, right? So you got He's the Keeper, you got Frightened, you got Sweet Pea, you got A Whale's Tale. I mean, those four songs alone that open that album are terrific songs. Song. So I don't. I think maybe Paul wasn't in a great place at the time, perhaps. But the songs really stand up on that LP, don't they? Yeah, they do. Every one of them, and obviously for obvious reasons, Heliocentric will always be my favourite. You know, I'm not saying it's the best, but you know, Stanley Road, whatever's brilliant. And but for me, it's got an emotional connection, and and particularly every song around that album because I've stood next to it live for the best part of twelve months. But for me, the favourite track of the album. Has definitely got to be frightened. The reason being, a bit later on, I had sort of health issues, mental health issues, and I used to play that track on loop, going to get it back, going to get it soon. That particular song from the album, you know, it, it, it is my, my favourite. Um, but every one of them, Sweet Pea, obviously, you know, he wrote about Leo. Definitely a brilliant album. And we all have our own favourites and, and for memories. But, you know, obviously, with me having that amazing experience, you know, I'm not going to say Stanley Rhodes my favourite or it's always going to be heliocentric because, you know, I've got that massive connection with it and, and my memories. And, and I was up close and personal to it for the best part of 12 months. You know, little venues festivals you know I was privileged I was blessed you know to be at the side when he's playing the piano to Frighten Door picking up sticks is another one I, I love that live that was brilliant that incredible Steve White drum solo halfway through as well right exactly you know and you know me and Steve are still very close 23 years on still keeping regular contact and to hear that you know he's an amazing drummer you know and that's no disrespect to Steve Pilgrim or whatever but Whitey for me was Style Council drummer you know I grew up with Whitey with the Style Council and the soul stuff and, and he's a beautiful soul like everyone involved in the band you know probably one of the best things to come out of that year was a friendship with Steve and I hope you don't mind me saying it you know he's been there for me when I've needed him and like a big brother to me you know he's been there for me when I've needed him over 23 years and I hope you don't mind me saying it but I speak honest from the heart you know he's a beautiful soul no, well, I know Steve listens, and hi, Steve, if you're listening, and fingers crossed, one day I'm going to try, and I'm still trying to persuade him to come on, you know. Um, let's talk about the tour. So, kicks off in Norwich, the waterfront, April 2000. Then we get Newcastle, we get Reading, we get Plymouth. I would have seen in Bristol, I was there in Bristol, what was then the Colston Hall. We go to Guildford, we got a couple of nights at the Royal Albert Hall. Where where have I put it? Look, the Royal Albert Hall obviously comes out as a DVD as well, right? There we are. We've got that under the stairs still. That has the orchestra. They did Nottingham, Nottingham Arena, and it, it just opened. And I was working there with the company I was working with, and I blagged myself backstage and I was speaking to John. And I think that would have been around May. And there was two hometown gigs coming up in Manchester, obviously, the Saturday night and the Sunday. That was the Apollo, right? It was, yeah. And this is brilliant as well. This I'm there. Right, you know, I'm working, I've got I've got my laminate on and, and I've gone outside and all that. And funny enough, I was speaking to the lad involved. Yes, he's a big Paul Weller fan and jam fan. And, and I've got my laminate on around my neck. And obviously there's a few people I might have known or whatever. And he's gone, what are you doing with that? I said, oh, band security. And they went, yeah, 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 of course you are. And Bonehead was there that night. Bonehead introduced the bands. For me, they're two special gigs as well. You know, to actually be on a stage with your favourite band and band members in your home city, where in the past you've been a punter in the stalls or standing up. That was quite special, really, to be fair. It was funny, Man City were playing the next day, Blackburn. 
and he had to win to get promotion. So I said to Paul back at the hotel after the gig on the Saturday, I said, if we win, you got to do something for me. you got to wear a City shirt or something. He went, oh, Simon, I can't do that. I said, but I promise I'll do something. So on the Sunday, like 20,000 of my mates have gone to Blackburn watching it on a hill. And I'm sat in the crew's tour bus double-decker outside the Apollo watching it upstairs on the telly. Fortunately, they did they beat Blackburn 4-1 and um, I'm waiting for the, um, the the band to turn up for the Sunday night at performance. So I said, right, Paul, you got you got to do something now with one. You know, because I love City as much as I love Paul and the band. And uh, to be fair, he kept to his word. I think he opened up with Changing Man and he said, this is dedicated to all the Man City fans. I mean, I know he likes Chelsea, but, you know, he he, he did. He kept to his word and, and he opened up with, for all you Man City fans in tonight, and he opened up with Changing Man. So cheers for that, Paul, listening. Nice one. <laughs> hey guys, this is Paige from Giggly Squad. This episode is brought to you by the new L'Oreal Paris Bright Reveal Dark Spot Serum and Broad Spectrum SPF 50 Daily Lotion. Dark spots, game over. This visibly fades all types of dark spots and visibly reduces the look of dark spots in just one week. The Bright Reveal SPF 50 Daily UV Lotion visibly reduces the appearance of dark spots and resists sun-induced signs of aging. It also has vitamin C and E to help protect against environmental damage caused by free radicals. Visit Target online and in stores to buy yours today. We also go to Aston Villa Leisure Centre. There's a couple of gigs there. We're off to Barrowlands, the Edinburgh Playhouse, Bournemouth, Cardiff, Brixton. That tour goes abroad. So we're in Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and festivals. So there was the Howden Pop Festival, and then there was also Witness in Ireland, the Fairy House Race Course, and V Festival, V2000. We did the Northern Leg first, and um, I remember meeting the band Warrington, I think it was, wherever it was, and then we did we did that, and then we, we travelled overnight down to Chelmsford, and we did Chelmsford. The following week, we were doing Glasgow Green, which for me is the one I remember. That's the one, because the Scottish audience were unbelievable. I remember it being a boiling hot day. It's actually, if you YouTube it, you know, there's a couple of songs on there from Glasgow Green 2000, and the band were on fire, seriously. And not, to be on that stage that night, you know, and I always considered myself a part of the band because that's where I was treated from John, God bless his soul, and Anne, Kenny. I was treated like a family member. You know, I, I don't, and I wouldn't come on here and say that without, I wasn't treated as a worker. I was probably treated as, you know, Paul's younger brother or Nicky's younger brother or whatever. And, but to be on that stage in Glasgow that night was just something else. And, and I've worked, obviously, because of the work I've done. I've done many a gigs. You know, I've been fortunate to see the Stones and get paid for it. You know, Bowie, Tina Turner, all these people. But to be up there that night in Glasgow on that stage was just something else. That is the one gig that will always stick with me. They were on fire. The whole lot of them were on fire. You mentioned band members before, but that night it was like Edgar Jones, Edgar Summertime, as he's called. Chrissy Holland, who's a lovely guy. This is Steve Craddock, Whitey, and obviously Paul himself. And, you know, anyone who was there were privileged and anyone who was not you know i suggest you go on youtube and have a look and see what it was like it was brilliant you talk about how it's you know it's a family and they're but they're making you to feel like you're part of the band the when you look at the tour itinerary it says autumn 2000 tour the band and it says yeah. paul weller steve white chris holland edgar jones steve craddock john weller kenny wheeler brendan highland simon o'brien and nathaniel weller and then it says crew and then it's got everybody else <laughs> yeah, but we're the band you know what i mean we're the band we're a bit more important i'm only joking <laughs> still know a lot of the crew um but roger's in the crew list he's not the band <laughs> roger no that's just something else in it you know what i mean it's like on the team sheet it's weird Dan. the way i look at it you know i know a lot of people love football i'm not sure if you do but for me it's like it's better than walking city on in the champions league final as captain and winning the Champions League. It's like, say, I'll mention, you know, Manchester United. It's like for any Man United fan who's a kid or a bit older, walking their team on in the front, you know, into the theatre of dreams, as they call it. Or the Etihad even, you know, walking City on. And that's how it was for me, walking the band on stage behind me. Wow. Talk me through the job description, right? I mean, this isn't an advert that they've put out and you've applied via LinkedIn, but what was the role that you had to do? What was your day-to-day responsibility? My job is to, is to protect the band, not let them go up and have an autograph or try and drag his guitar. And I'm not, things happen. Things happen. You know, fans get a bit giddy. My primary role with Brendan when I'm on that stage is to look after my principals, let them do what they're doing without being interrupted. I know from... Um, 
for people who've not seen it, the uh, Brixton Academy gig in 91. If you watch the last song, he does moods. And just as he's going on, there's a stage invader. But the lad who was looking after him at the time, I think he was Big Chrissy Dojo. You know, he's on it. He's on it like lightning. He's, he's run over and he's just picked the lad up off his, uh, off his feet. And basically, that's what the role is. You're there to sort of like look after the band, making sure that backstage is secure. You liaise with the local security, tell them what you want, get the pass sheets up. You're in the dressing room and some people have nerves, some don't. But as, and as much as you're loving the music, because you are, you're a fan, you're having to work, you're having to be in the zone of looking out for people, looking at what's possibly going to happen, who are the people who are off their face and going to try and get on stage, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, it's, it's not just that. I remember, it might have been Guildford you mentioned, I remember I was up on the stage and I could see a red light in the audience. So I jumped down, so I went round the back, sort of walked through the crowd. There's a guy there with a video camera, so I've grabbed him. Not grabbed him that I said, you know, can you come for a walk with me? So I took him backstage and uh, I think Big Kenny took took the what you call it. I mean, we've got camera phones now, haven't we? You couldn't do it now. Imagine that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. About yeah. 3,000 camera phones. <laughs> you know, so you're not just watching the band. You're watching out for other stuff like that. And obviously, you know, you could have sold it as a bootleg or whatever. And I'm, I'm not being a killjoy, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I'm doing a job. Seeing the red lights, so I was down. Took him backstage and um, his, his film was confiscated, so we say. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be taken through to see Kenny, would you? As lovely as Kenny is, I bet, I bet back in the day he was terrifying. <laughs> well, same as for me, you know, same as in the past. I, I, I've had my run-ins with Kenny, I remember. You know, and I love Kenny Wheeler. Come on, Tottenham. You know, I, I remember I was waiting outside the Apollo one night to have a picture with a band and it was on the other side and he, he told me to go away in uncertain way. Uh, <laughs> and again, this is to go back to Steve White. You know, I was there with my partner at the time and Steve White, God bless his soul, he got off the coach, come over and he had a picture with me. And take me on the tour bus, take me on the road with these guys, right? Um, I mean, I could, I could mean literally, but I, I mean, figuratively speaking, take me there. What is it like? What is that camaraderie like on the road with the band? One of the first things I advice I was given was don't get involved in cards. I don't play cards anyway. <laughs> you know, I'm out there to earn money, not lose it. So we started the tour, you know, we met in London and and it starts there. That's where the connection starts. As soon as you get on the bus, you know, everyone's on and people are doing whatever they're doing, like, you know, John or Kenny's playing cards or Paul or I'm sat talking with Steve. Got Edgar going to the back, strumming his guitar. Chrissy Holland was quite quiet. And I've got a little funny story here. Playing in Dorset, but we were staying in Bournemouth. The bus is outside. Um, I, I can't remember who we were waiting for. I think we might have been waiting for Chrissy Holland. And I remember this woman coming on from the hotel, getting on the bus, and all the bands on there. And she says, have we got Simon O'Brien on there? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's me. And she's got a little plastic bag with me underwear, and I'd left it in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite funny. That sort of broke the ice, really. Every day is good. <laughs> <laughs> did you have your name in them <laughs> i wouldn't do it again so yeah that's all so there's paul there's hereford blackpool carlisle hull and then the last night is earl's court can i just mention blackpool blackpool was brilliant um because on the friday we had a night off and we stayed in preston so it was a night off for us all really the band uh, we were doing blackpool on saturday evening the band wanted to go out for a curry but john didn't you know, John wanted to stay in the hotel, so so Paul says to me, you, you, you know, we stay with my dad and all that. So I said, yeah. So me, me and John had a meal together, you know, and, and we could talk intimate. And, you know, I love John. I really do. I'm getting shivers down my back now when I'm speaking about it. And, you know, I was saying, you know, how privileged I was um, to be in this position, how much I love Paul. I even, you know, my son, you know, he's actually called Kieran Paul O'Brien. We were just talking about music, you know, we were talking about, John's boxing and the family. We had a lovely meal together, you know, and he said, just get what you want off thingy. And this is how special John was, you know. Um, obviously, you, you get so many complimentaries, you know, not me personally, the band and whatever, guest list and that. And he just said, Simon, just see if any of the hotel staff want to come tomorrow. You know, that's how nice he was, you know what I mean? Not a lot of people would do that, but that's the measure of John, as he was always been from the jam, you know, when he let the fans in and... You know, so I just went round some of the staff members in the hotel and said, would you like to come to the gig tomorrow? And um, so me and John had a meal together. That, that was a special memory. It was just me and him. Nice. At some point in the, probably the years ahead, but at some point in the future, I'd like to grab all the John Weller stories from all these episodes and turn that into just a special story. Because so many of these stories about John are so heartfelt from people. He meant so much to so many. He did. He did. You know, this podcast I want to dedicate to the memory of John. 
because without John and Anne, there won't be Paul and his music and the memories and me and you won't be having this conversation. So I think for me, you know, it is a privilege coming on here, but it's a thank you to John, really. And I mean, that heartfelt, you know, he's still special to me. I see him as my dad. Yeah, I was, I was blessed. He's a, he's a beautiful soul. You know, you've heard it off everyone else that's been on. He's one special person, you know, and, and the lovely Anne as well. So thank you. Nice. Let's talk about that final night of the tour. So this is Earl's Court. This is Saturday, the 4th of November. There's actually a couple of stages. The top loader, one of the main supports. I think Fingley Quay's on the Dum Dums. There's an acoustic stage. We've got David Holmes DJing. I think there's even like Kung Fu all teaching people how to do Kung Fu. It's like a, almost like a little mini festival within Earl's Court, right? Well, yeah, what we did, we travelled up Friday morning. I can't remember where it was, but I know it was a long journey. We were doing the sound check on the Friday night and I remember we pulled outside this engine takeaway across from Earl's Court and Paul wanted something to eat. So I'm jumping off the bus and going, watching his back in an Indian takeaway. So we went over, we did the sound check and... Um, there was a guy I know who was looking after Liam Gallagher at the time because Liam was coming, so I was, I was chatting with him about the arrangements. And then, uh, like, the Friday night was sorting the guest list out with Brendan. And with it being in London, you know, certainly going to be more people on the guest list, friends of Paul's, friends of the family. Probably the busiest, obviously, with it being a home, hometown gig for Paul. Quite a few of the band members who are sort of from London, really. And also, I guess, end of the tour, right? So there's a bit of a, a celebratory thing because they've got through, you know, the whole of the year. It's the culmination of everything they've done on that album, yeah? Well, yeah, exactly. And it gives me a chance here to men- mention the wonderful Anne Weller. She got me a bottle of wine and a lovely gift pack and she, she put a lovely message on to me. Thanks for looking after Nathaniel and all that. So that was nice. You know, it's Christmas. It's like any profession, isn't it? You're getting up to near Christmas, you know, just because it's music. It's no different than collecting bins again towards the end of the year but it, it was going to be special because obviously there was a lot of friends of the band there you know Liam was there Alan White was there I remember chatting to Alan White after the gig and the after show and you know it was good and it was it was interesting because I was only when I reminded myself of the fact that it was it was different to the rest of the tour in the sense that there's all this other stuff going on at Earl's Court well yeah I think it was the first time I let little Leo and I still call her little Leo Leo well I'm so proud of how she's turned out and, and her career and I, and I remember walking her through the crowd in Earl's Court to go and see Anne and Nikki you know who was doing merchandise and I was talking to Dee that night and she was saying you know thanks for looking after Natty and, and Leo yeah it was good so I I'm so glad she's doing well. Post being part of the crew, obviously you're still a Weller fan, or even more so. This is more ingrained within you. You went out to Barcelona a couple of years later. A friend of mine who took over sort of the security with Paul, a lad called Ian McAllister, he's sort of connected as well with um, Steve Craddock and um, Ocean Colour Scene. So Ian was looking after the band. So I just basically went out to Barcelona to see the band. and But I was staying in the same hotel as the band, the Hotel Majestic it was in Spain. So I got off back to the hotel, but what I did, I phoned Ian up and said, the bar's closing in a bit, ask anyone to do what out. So I think Paul just wanted a pint, but I got Paul a pint in for when he come back. And we went out for a walk, myself, Ian, Paul, I think Kenny Wheeler come out, and we just sort of went for a couple of quiet drinks on the um, in Barcelona. Getting back to that um, Illumination album, I'd, I'd gone to see the band at Manchester Apollo, I think it was 2002, and they brought Illumination out. And um, I've gone back to the hotel with the band and, and I'm having a little drink with Paul. And I think the reason me and Paul got on is because, as you can imagine, a lot of people like Starstruck, Blow Smoke and, and blah de blah but it was never like that with me. Do you know what I mean? As much as I loved him, you know, I was just me. He asked me what I thought of Illumination. And I give him my honest opinion at the time which I couldn't broadcast. <laughs> oh, not a fan. Broadcast. <laughs> Funny enough, I was going on holiday the next day to the Canary Islands with my partner at the time and my son, and he says to me, he gave me a big hug when I was going, and he said, I suggest you buy it at the airport in the morning, take it away with you and have a good list. We'll be listening now, Paul, all these years on it, so it's a good album. <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't yours all the time, man. Eh? No, I was just honest, just honest, you know. <laughs> He's the expert on music, I'm, I'm not, but obviously it just come out after Heliocentric, so Heliocentric was my baby and always be my baby. You know, I just said, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
God bless Paul. You know, he, he didn't take it in the wrong way. He just he just gave me a big hug and says, make sure you buy out the airport and have a good listen while you're away. <laughs> it's been really great over the past couple of years for, I mean, obviously Ian Munn has been you know, banging the drum for the Style Council over so many years now, but it's been lovely over the past couple of years to, to really see that recognition for them. That fantastic Sky Arts documentary from Bax and Lee and Mono Media was a terrific piece of work, but it must have been so lovely as a Style Council fan to have seen the four of them back together performing a very deep sea at the end of that documentary, right? Definitely. Again, shivers, shivers down my back. Style Council means so much to many people, you know, people around my age. And for that to come out and give the chance for people who maybe wasn't familiar with the music, it was brilliant. Um, good to see them back doing what they're doing. And, and you know what? Through the lights of Ian Mon, through the lights of yourself, what was the old Style Council saying? Keeps on burning the flame, you know, and it, this stuff will go on and it's through the lights of you what you've done, you know, and, 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 you know, fair play to you. You know, I've met some lovely people. I've got friends on social media, which I wouldn't have only through sort of the Style Council and Paul Weller, not just the, the memories of the music and what it means to everyone, but, you know, it, it's built up friendships, you know, long may it continue and, you know, and, and, and the younger generation um, get on it, on the music and whatever. I, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I mean, I know Paul sort of tried doesn't like looking back really. It's all forward, you know, but me, I'm, sort of more the opposite I, I do a lot of looking back as well because it obviously brings back good stuff to me you know what I've shared in the podcast and special memories and special people in my life at different times in my life two final questions for you before you go Simon you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life it can be the jam the star council or solo what are you going to go with easy my ever changing moods it's a great song it's a great but which version because there are multiple right all of them <laughs> That's cheating. I think the best performance I've ever seen of moods is at Brixton Academy on video obviously I think that with the movement you know he had, he had to show he was back I never get tired of putting that on my social media I like every version of moods pardon the pun it depends what mood I'm in you know sometimes I'll listen to the piano version sometimes I'll, I'll watch on YouTube the ones where Damon Minchell is in it and where he says you're well bloody dressed and all that so it depends where I'm at really but all day long moods because it resonates with me, you know, and that, that was the first real song to sort of hit home for not just the musical reasons, emotionally reasons. So It's also incredible the fact that here he is in 2023 and he's been, some of the tour dates in Europe just recently, he was kicking off. That was the first song, I think. Well, he can do that, can't he? Because he's, he's got that much of a repertoire. When you're that good and you've got such a good repertoire, you don't have to end it with moods or whatever. Or... Yeah, you don't have to warm anybody up. You're just straight in there. Bomb. Final question, Simon. It's been a delight to hear your stories, your connections, and thank you so much for getting in touch. And you know the reason why I created this podcast? It was because I had one big regret from giving up my life as a radio presenter that I never got to interview Paul Weller. So I created a podcast to make it happen. So if it happens, what should I ask him, Simon? Have you not already met him? I met him in Sainsbury's car park. What would it have been? 2007? I was doing a promotion for Nexa at the time for the local radio station, Eagle Radio, and handed him a chocolate bar. And, I, and all I could think to say at the time was just as I shook his hand, was big fan, big fan, and everything else emptied out of my head. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to say, but if I was to make a suggestion, I'd just be you and not kiss his backside. Because obviously be polite, and you've got to take it back to me. I was a massive finger, you know, Stars, not just in music, they're so used to having smoke blown up the backsides. So everyone is just a thingy. So the only sort of advice I'd give if you do meet him or do interview him, just be you. Because that's why I was. I was just me. I said, I'm a bin man in my side. I love you and all that. But I, I never kissed his backside. As much as I love him, I never kissed his backside. He, he'll tell you that. You know, he'll tell you, I'm not ashamed to say that. I was me. And I think maybe that's why we got on so well, to be fair. There was intimate moments between us and chatting and all that, but obviously I'd never sort of disclose that. That was, you know, between the two of us. Because at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We all have feelings. We all have kids, grandkids, some of us. Although it's about the music, you know, at the end of the day, it's about us as people in it. And so I'd just be you and say, you know what? The music's brilliant, but Simon told me not to kiss your backside. So I'm not going <laughs> to... There's a danger where he thinks 170 episodes of a podcast is technically kissing his ass, but hopefully not. <laughs> he's a top guy and, you know, I'm glad he's settled and, you know, and he's happy. He's changing people's lives, whether it's through his music in the past or the new stuff he's bringing out, you know, and, you know, he's worked hard and the people around him and, you know, he deserves all the success in the world and we all deserve to be um, happy, healthy and, and live good lives, you know. Simon, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, man. Take care. Thanks a lot, man. 
My thanks once again to Simon O'Brien for joining me on the podcast. You can find images in the show notes for this episode of the podcast, including that tour itinerary that I mentioned. Just head to my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Whilst you're there, why not head into our store, get yourself our official podcast mug. Plus, as we head into proper winter, you're going to need your Paul Weller Fan podcast, your desperately seeking Paul sweatshirt. You'll find it, of course, in our store. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, do spread the word on social media at well of fan pod on x or you can find us instagram facebook threads just search for paul weller fan podcast so please do share this episode with your friends your mates the weller communities help to spread the word about this podcast unbelievably there are still fans of the jam the star council paul weller solo all three or a combination of who have no idea this thing exists It's all about the algorithms on social media. So anything you can do to spread the word is always appreciated. And if you have enjoyed, please do leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. It all helps to move us up the rankings as well. And if you want to help out financially, we're always really appreciative of that. You can buy a virtual coffee in my store as well. Just go online. You'll find the entire archive of all of our podcast interviews at paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.